There was a person cried several times to Allah, I want to kill Christians. I want to kill Jews. I want to glorify your name. You know, with my friends in the government in Iran, we planned a lot of things, evil things for Christian world, cruel things for Jewish world, deceiving um, plans for black world. But by the grace of God, I am here speaking for the glory of his name. Once, once trying to destroy the church, but now I'm trying to establish the church of God, strengthen it, and cherish my love toward all other nations, including Muslims and Jews. I've come from the country Iran. I've got some photos to show you. How is that going to come there? Ah. Uh, from this country, from the northern part of this country, from this section, was born in a nominal Islamic family. Many Muslims are nominal, and they do not know Islam, but simply they call themselves Muslim. My parents picked me up from, you know, amongst the 12 children of the house because I was quicker in learning. And so they nominated, nominated me to be the religious boy in the family. And they invested in my life. I learned very quickly the Arabic reading of it and reciting the Quran, reading the Quran in Arabic. That's not Iranian language. At the age of nine, I became famous. People even called me to their, you know, religious ceremonies, and I recited the Quran for them. You imagine a nine years old boy. We learned from childhood that Christians and Jews are unclean. That's written in the Quran. We learned from the mosque and from the community, don't touch them. If you see them, don't shake hand with them. Because they're unclean and then you become unclean, you need to rush and wash yourself. Before washing yourself, don't touch any Muslim. You make them unclean too. Now, this is not unclean. That doesn't mean you haven't made, you know, taken shower. That's unclean spiritually. They are not humankind. We also use this, especially from the area I'm coming from. People use these two words, words Christian and Jew as swear words. Two Muslims fight with each other. They call each other Christian or Jew. Iranian government with Saddam's government did that eight years. Iranian government was calling Saddam a Jew in the war and Saddam was calling Iranian government a Jew. So that's the mindset of people. You do not, you're brainwashed from childhood that they are not humankind and they deserve to die and you do not feel for them unfortunately. I am coming from there and I glorify his name that he changed my life and my family's life. I have stories with him. That's not my work to come to him. He has really brought me. I have stories with him from since I was a young lad from the year, you know, seven. I was 12 years old. My first story started with Jesus. One day in our sports hour, we were playing in the playground of the school. Seven boys got together, you know, trying to play with each other. Trying to find also a game to play with each other. One of the boys said, I know a game. He took a paper from his notebook, divided in seven, went in a corner, wrote something inside each, folded them, rolled them very well, and came to us and mixed them very well. He said, this is the game. Each one of us going to take one and open in turn. The things written inside each, he said, shows our future. So we each took one, and then we were fighting with each other who should be the first, second, third, or the last one. Some of us were fighting to be the last one, but I succeeded. I was the seventh one. We were in year seven, seven boys. I was the seventh one opened it. The first one opened there was written, you'll become a teacher. We tried to make our time fun with each other, you know, jumped, you know, clubbed, 
show the excitement. The other one, you'll become a mayor. The other one, you'll become um, an engineer or army officer. At the end, I opened mine, there was written, you'll become a Christian. <laughs> no fun anymore. <laughs> I was embarrassed. I was more religious than them, full of shame, angry. My face changed. And I said, I have to go and kill this boy. I attacked him. He screamed. I said, I'm going to kill you. Why did you write this for me? He was crying. He said to me, did I write that for you? You didn't see I mixed them very well? I could have taken that. It's your problem. It's your future. You're blaming me. <laughs> he was right. He didn't put in my hand. He was right. And for that reason, I didn't kill him. <laughs> but I did not play with them anymore. I went and found a corner, you know, sat there, cried and wept, cried to Allah, complained to him that you embarrassed me in front of this boy. So that was my first story. I finished my high school, entered the university. In the university, I became a radical Muslim, followed Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah in that time was in Iraq because he was Shiite and Saddam Sunni. They didn't like each other. Saddam forced him out and he went to France. Unfortunately, France welcomed him very warmly. And Western countries, oh my goodness. You need to wake up really. Because they were going to use him as a shield in front of the Russian communism. But they didn't know that Islam doesn't let anyone to become a sincere friend with you. There are ample verses in the Quran that say don't become friends with Christians and Jews. So, through their help, we didn't know that. We thought that's the miracle of Allah. And through his guidance, we overthrow the most powerful king in the Middle East. And the king escaped. We captured the country. Ayatollah entered the country. That, in that day, I cried with many other students. We were so excited. We said we are going to have freedom and democracy because Ayatollah promised us Islam when we come there and rule the country we will have democracy. He was lying to 70 million people. Well, Islam says if it is necessary you can lie to 70 billion people to hold the world. You know, until you get, you know, to the power. We didn't know that zealous Muslims, young people I was reading the Quran from the beginning to the end without understanding what Quran is saying. <laughs> because it's in Arabic. You just get the blessing when you recite that in Arabic. We were so excited. Ayatollah entered in the second week with my group. We went and welcomed him very warmly. This is the photo I have taken from him. He's sitting here. We committed ourselves to him in that day, promised him to make every single Iranian radical Muslim and to take Islam to the end of the world. After that, because I was a famous boy, I was invited with two others to start a revolutionary army. This is me here. Now, have you heard about the word Hezbollah? This is the word produced in Iran first. We were Hezbollah. We wanted, Hezbollah means the party of Allah, the, the hosts of Allah. And we were called to start the revolutionary army. The major goal of the revolutionary army was to go and capture Israel, to make Israel as a capital state for all Islamic world. And with that, to attract the attention of wide spectrum Muslim in the world and say to them, you have to start from wherever you are to fight against Christians and Jews. You know, to do that, we needed to establish our army in a country nearby. So we started Hezbollah in Lebanon. Iranian started Hezbollah there. Iranian paid now to Hezbollah. Hezbollah's boss is in Iran, Hezbollah in Lebanon. And uh, so that was one of the major goals of this um, army. That again there, 
This is me here praying in a mountainside, Islamic prayer. Three boys are following me um, in that prayer. We see two boys are sitting there. They are moderate Muslims. We were trying to make them radical in five or ten minutes. <laughs> Many people think, wow, this radical Muslim have studied a lot. Now just, the, I think every Muslim from childhood learns how to be anti-Christian, anti-Jew. So they have to some extent. And then you need really to work a little bit, um, you know, to make them radical. Especially when they live in an environment that's full of radical Muslims there. And mountain also is so important for committed radical Muslim. You have heard so far many times that Osama bin Laden is in mountain. You know, Taliban is in mountainous area. Even those four boys who were involved in suicide bombing in England, they just came from mountain. You remember that? Because it's important. Mountain is, you know, is a, is a place you can speak freely there and you can hide yourself there. After that, I became involved with mobilizing young boys and girls for our second major goal. That's my photo there. There just photos shows three of us there. Our second major goal was to destroy America. To do that, we needed to mobilize all our young boys and girls. Why America? Because America is a superpower Christian country in the world. That's embarrassing to Islam. A Christian country superpower? Islam is going to be superpower. Islam should be. America has millions of Jews unbearable to Islam. America has many, you know, army agreements with many countries, including Australia, helping many countries. If we destroy America, then it's easier to capture other countries. They spend billions of dollars, you know, over America. So for that reason, we attracted the attention of many young boys and girls and took them to the army camp and taught them the terrorist techniques in the future to send them as students or uh, through different channels to Western countries and especially America to fulfill our goals. This is my wife. She was also a radical Muslim, a fiery girl. <laughs> I said, wow, this is mine. <laughs> because every... A leader who thirsts for the blood of others should have really such a lady, you know, to fight uh, side by side. So f for the same interest, we got married. This is her and also two other girls that are learning that uh, rifle, how to use it. Our marriage was held in the mosque. That's not popular in the Middle East. We did that. For the sake of Islam, we wanted really to bring the culture of Muhammad to our time. Mosque should be the center of everything. You have to teach your followers. Especially two important things should be in the mosque, start from the mosque. First one is jihad, fighting against non-Muslims. That's a center, a fortified center for Muslims, not many Muslims really go to mosque for that reason, but the leaders know that. And the committed radical Muslims know that, that this is the place for us in the future we will kill these people if they do not become Muslim. I think I don't need to teach you. You see from Iraq, even Shiites and Sunnis are killing each other that start from the mosque. You know, they killed the... People in Indonesia, just clergy, spoke in the mosque and they went out and killed. Just, you know, two years ago they were going to kill three, four Christian girls. One of them survived. Just it started from the mosque. So for that reason, that was, you know, the major reason, one of the major reasons. The second one involves non-Islamic countries. In the Quran is written... World is yours to Muslims, even the lands you haven't put your step in. Chapter 33, verse 27. In Islamic doctrine also, you have to prove that this country is mine. You have to build your mosque there. According to Islamic doctrine, if you build a mosque in a country, that country after that is an Islamic country. So is there any mosque in Australia? 
Well, Islam says it's not yours. Also, you're not a true citizen of this country. You're a second-class citizen. When Islam comes and rules that this country, and then you have to buy your life and your family's life every year in order to survive, according to the Quran chapter 9. I'm not here to frighten you. I'm here to encourage you that if you, the follower of Jesus Christ, you need to claim this country for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he is good. You claim everything for good thing, and he is the best. It's so good to hand over this country to Jesus rather than to Muhammad. So that was our goal. That for that reason, we invited them to come to the church, to the mosque, and to to our wedding. Now this is our marriage day. Do you see any smile on their faces? <laughs> now Islam is the religion of anger. I'm not talking about Muslims again. You better go and read the Quran. It's easier now. Just go to the internet, download, click their killing verses. Or hatred. You will find plenty. It's just opposite to the face of Christ. The greatest mark of Islam is anger. The greatest mark of Jesus is joy, love. That's why we needed to teach seriousness, authoritarian spirit, you know, leadership to our followers. There is a subject, there was a subject called angry subject. I was the teacher of that angry subject to my followers. <laughs> how to become angry, how to hate. Do you think it's easy to cut the head of a person? You teach them gradually, and then they kill for that reason. So that's um, why we are not uh, smiling there. After our marriage, see my face there? <laughs> my daughter is five and a half years old here. That's why she's not covered like my wife. You cover your daughters as a committed Muslim from the age of seven. Because age of seven is the age of marriage in Islam. That's why you younger girl need to praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He is so good. At 25 years I have studied all other philosophies and religions. He is so good. Every day you need to say, Jesus, I love you, I praise your name. One of Muhammad's wife was six years old, Aisha. She has got a lot of writings, actually, in Islamic writing. And uh, Muhammad was 49 years old. And Islamic tradition says she was consummated at the age of eight or nine. You're eight or nine. That's why she's not covered. My family, myself, this photo was everywhere in my hometown. Because I was, in the second year, I became the leader of the political party, influential politician, announced my candidacy for Islamic parliament. But this time, we were oppositions to Ayatollah. Because till the second year, we discovered that this, whatever this man said to Iranian was lie. And then he said, and others said, that was for the sake of Islam. Now, okay, you said we will have freedom. We are not going to give this freedom to Jews, Christians, or Zoroastrians. We are your Muslim brothers. Now it doesn't work. You have to blindly now follow the leader, even as a Muslim. It's hard for Iranian. Iranian are the most open Muslims in the world. Now, that's not because I have come from Iran, because my doctorate is about culture, cultural differences. We said, now we want freedom. We won. My colleague became the president of the country with 98% of people's vote. The first president after the Islamic Revolution. Government fell in our hand, but that angered Ayatollah, and especially his 
clergy friends. First in secret they started to kill the members and oppositions. Three times they sent rockets to the living place of president and eventually president escaped from Iran. Government was, you know, destroyed. Some of us were able to escape, some were killed. I was one of them kidnapped in nighttime, put in a dead cell. It was a toilet. I lived first three months in, in a toilet. Painful prison. In that prison, you beg them to kill you. I don't know you really believe me or not. Because they do not kill you once, they, unfortunately, you have to enjoy by giving pain to your opposition and to your enemies. Especially if you're a girl, opposition, and when you get a death penalty, that's so pain for you and for your family. To kill a virgin girl is sin. You have to sleep with her first and then kill her. Now the pain is after that because in Islam is a religion of fear. You have to frighten every member of the family. That's why they're trying to frighten the world. And unfortunately, many Western people are afraid. Unfortunately, sadly. After killing that girl, you take the dress of that girl. That's your religious obligation. You need to do that. And you go and talk to her mom. You knock the door. I want to talk to this girl, mom. Mom comes there. You say, your girl was mine. I slept with her. We killed her. And this is the dress of your daughter. They broke the heart of many Iranian mothers. Were they Jews, Christians, or Austrians? No, Muslims. Islam, my friend, is a cruel religion, even this slaughters Muslims. Many Muslims are here, even in this country, in other countries, they do not know that. When these leaders get to the power, they will kill first their own followers. Iranian government, Iranian system killed between 50 to 60,000 only young Iranian girls and boys. That's the prison I'm talking about. It, they shock you really with, you know, immoral words. They kidnapped me with my pajamas, you know. I'm sorry, they were just, you know, looking inside on my body and saying to me, who is going to sleep with your wife tonight? Because outside they show themselves righteous. Iranians really do not think that these people are rude that much. And they were too. One of them said, well, he's going to finish. It's you on me. That's the prison. From there, they took me to another prison with my four other friends. We were waiting in the death row with four other friends in a, in a cell. All four were killed, and I could escape by the grace of God. It's a long story. It's a painful story, too. If I say that to you, this section takes one and a half hours. But I just simply say to you, by the grace of Jesus, I could escape. Even though I didn't know him. But he had a plan for me. You remember that ballad? And I have other stories, other prophecies, even Muslims prophesied. So I could escape the death penalty and from the country Iran to Turkey. In Turkey, I was a wandering man. I didn't know about my future. I started to learn the language and entered university to make myself busy. In the second year, I found a fellow Iranian man. He had business there. We became friends with each other. After a while, he invited me to put my money with his make the capital larger. I did. But later, my friend took all my money and his escaped to Germany. Another pain came to my life. I couldn't do anything because everything was written in his name. Now, he was going to a church there. He was not a Christian. He was Muslim. There was an Iranian Christian fellowship in Istanbul, in Turkey. Those Christians who were not able to live inside the country, Iran, after the Islamic Revolution, they escaped and they went to Turkey. And with some other foreign friends, American and European, they started the fellowship. 
and they having fellowship with each other and also working among Iranian refugees. They built friendship with many and this man was one of them. He was going to, the, to that church sometimes. That caused me to go to that church to ask them why this happened to me. This man was coming here. He was my friend. He took all my money and escaped. For the first time in my life, I'm going to a church. Challenging and scary. Well, challenging because church is an unclean place. Scary is the, you know, was the strongest part. Now, I have escaped from the death penalty. Now I'm going to create another one for myself. Especially a politician like me, why you're going to a church? And especially in that area, there were very committed Muslim Turks there. Anyway, my money encouraged me to go in. I entered the church, I was shocked. People were playing music and they were singing inside the church. Music is evil in Islam. You remember just last year the leader, Muslim leader here in Australia said to the Muslim, withdraw your children from music class. Because it's evil, I was shocked. Now everybody was standing and singing. I said, I'm not going to stand to share this evil spirit with them. That's not Iranian really, they stand with you. But I was afraid to stand with them. I said, no, I'm, I'm going to sit. I sat behind everybody closer to the main door. I said, it's good to sit here. If something is strange happens, easier to run out. <laughs> that again is the mindset of committed Muslim and radical Muslim. You think that they are united with each other. Only fear is bringing them together. Uncertainty is everywhere there. Anyway, nothing happened inside the church. After the fellowship, they came and welcomed me very warmly. I said the story to them. They became so sad that I had lost the big money to a man who was sometimes going to that church. They promised me to help me. We can help you, they said. We have many friends in Germany. We are going to write to them to find this man and to beg him to give you your money back. They encouraged me to go to the church. They said we, if we get any response from them, we would be able to share that with you. After that, week after week, I went to the church. I never missed any Sunday <laughs> for my money. <laughs> week after week, I saw these people are so nice people. My goodness. We call these people immoral people because Christians are the most immoral people in the world, in Islam. Is this immorality? This is so nice. We call these people ungodly, infidel, unclean people. I said, what a wonderful people these ungodly, unclean people are. <laughs> they are sacrificially helping Muslims. We say don't touch them, but not only they are touching us, they are sacrificing their time, their money for us. Their messages also were so powerful, my friend. I was teaching philosophy in Iran, and I was very much interested in Iranian poetry. In Iranian poetry, it, it encourages you to search for God in this world. I loved really to have God in my life. But for the first time, I was shaken by their messages. They said, we belong to the kingdom of God, not Satan anymore. God is mighty, isn't he? Every Muslim knows God is mighty. Can mighty God save? This is a powerful question. You can ask you know, people from every religious group. Is your God mighty? Why he is not able to save you here? If you call your mother and father, I need you, please come and help me. Do they ignore you? Why your God is not helping you to save you here? Why he is leaving you in uncertainty? What kind of God is this? We are saved. We are in the kingdom of God. If God is with you, who can be against you? Powerful stuff. It worked here. I loved it. But I didn't say to them I love it. Because they had some ideas, I didn't like them. Jesus is God. 
Most of them scholars hate this. Koran hates that. They believe, Koran says, Christians have made a man as God for themselves. Koran doesn't know, Muhammad doesn't know, scholars you know, do not know. It's not a man-made God. It's God who made himself a man. This is different philosophy. They said also, Jesus is the only way, only Savior. I said, this is selfish. <laughs> what about others? Jesus is the Son of God. Oh my goodness, this is the worst one. <laughs> You're the worst of creatures. You go to hell and you have to be killed. They also spoke a lot about Jews. Open the Bible, read it, Jews, close it, Jews. I hated Jews. I said, what is wrong with these nice people? <laughs> Beautiful people, funny ideas. <laughs> I said, I'm going to help these people. <laughs> these people are so nice people. They are going to get my money back. I have to pay back. This much I can't do. They are open people. That's good. You can criticize them. They do not kill you if you criticize them. Because if you criticize anybody in the Middle East, you're in problem. Koran, your fingers should be chopped first, and then your head. Chapter 8, verse 10 to 13. 33, 36. Nobody can speak above the words of Muhammad. So it has penetrated the life of people even for normal things. You cannot criticize each other. But these people, you can criticize them. I remember one day, I went to the pastor of the church. He was an American. I said to him, sir, I think you did a mistake. He said, just one? <laughs> I do a lot of mistakes, he said. I was embarrassed. I said, wow. I was expecting him to say something, you know, you know, aggressive to me. And he really was a humble man. He said, sir, thank you so much for reminding me, for telling me that. Could you do a favor to me? It's so hard to carry the mistakes with yourself. I just want to repent to God now. And he repented to God. You know, he's an old man. Iranian people respect really old people. It was so humbling to me. So that's why I said, I can't help these people. I can't go to them. I said, friends, you're nice people, but I think you're far behind. <laughs> but glory to Jesus, they changed my life. Oh, my goodness. You know, the values of Jesus are so powerful, are so powerful. You just need to be a simple follower of Jesus Christ, to so simply follow him to change the life of people. And these people were those people there, really. And if you're simple, he comes into your life in a mighty way, works through their life, you know, in, in, in your life. And he did. I was thinking to change them, they changed my life. And also Jesus was supernaturally working in my life. One night I had a dream. There was earthquake, fire everywhere, violent wind. I was in my father's house, exactly my father's house. So frightening, houses were destroyed, people you know, died. I, I called God, please God, do not leave me alone, I'm afraid, please help me. In that time, a light appeared to me, said to me, I am Jesus, I will help you. Come out from your father's house. I rushed out, the house fell down. I woke up, I saw that was a dream. I couldn't sleep anymore, it was the middle of the night, very, very painful. The following Sunday, I went to the church. I was amazed. A preacher was preaching there. The title of his message was, The House and the Rock of Jesus. In his message, he said everything I had seen in my dream, heard in my dream. Come out from your father's house. Come out from your old house. Live in the house that Jesus has built for you. Your father's house is the old tradition you have inherited from your forefathers. It's the house of pain. It's the house of sin. It's the house of hostility, ignorance, indifference. Every pain is coming from that house. Come out. Live in the house that Jesus has built for you. It's the house of absolute joy, absolute peace, absolute freedom. Jesus, like an eagle soaring on the high, because I saw him as a light there on the high, 
He's calling us, come to me, I will establish you on a higher ground. This is the ground of God, Satan cannot reach there. Come to him, do not ignore him. Fully amazed and shocked. I said, what is this man talking about? This, this was my dream. In that day, I became interested to read their books. They gave me a New Testament. By reading that book, I was amazed. I was really amazed. Bible is an amazing book. Not because I'm a Christian, I'm saying that. Honestly, I'm saying to you. Because I have studied all other scriptures. This is an amazing book. It really changed whole dimension of my life. Destroyed my philosophy and planted this philosophy there. I discovered from the just first pages of the gospel that God in the Bible is a relational God. Jesus said the kingdom of God is in you. If God is not relational, how can he come in you? In philosophical language, it's called personal God. I didn't know there is one God who is personal. All gods are impersonal. Because they are impersonal, they do not have any attributes and personality in order to relate to other people. So they just stay away. That's why Muhammad didn't visit his God. Because he is impersonal. But God here is relational. It, I was amazed. Because gospel opened my eyes. If God is impersonal, how he can create a personal being? God must be personal in order to create personal being. By the way, impersonal gods do not reveal themselves. If someone does not reveal himself, how he is going to touch, take, shape, dust and breathe in it and give it? Even, you know, a living spirit. It was so powerful. Now, gospel is not saying this directly, but because I was teaching philosophy, it just was so powerful and amazing to me. Wow, wow, wow. Can I have God here? Gospel is saying that. Can I be with God? Can I be saved here? Can I get rid of the uncertainty? Muhammad died in uncertainty. Muhammad, the prophet of the so-called perfect religion. If religion is perfect, sir, why you died in uncertainty? But this tiny little community is saying to me, I am with God. I am with God. I was amazed doctrinally. I was reading Paul's words in Romans chapter 5. He says, one man brought sin to this world. Oh, this is the yummiest part. <laughs> one man brought sin to this world, whereas in all other religions, including Islam, God's brought sin to this world. What? Is there a God who does not touch sin, who does not create sin? That was powerful. And that chapter is a powerful chapter. Paul is a wonderful man, if I, I can say to you really daily here. This man's philosophy and doctrine is so powerful. He is saying that through the sin of one man, all people were corrupted. Adam did sin, and sin came into the life of people. Therefore, through the life and through the work of a righteous one, all will be saved. You see, this is making sense. Because in all other religions, there is not any righteous one to send. Even gods are not righteous. If a god creates sin, can you call that god? Are you able to call that god a righteous god? No. If you touch sin, you live with sin, you create sin, you're not righteous. But this is a powerful chapter. One sinner made all people, led them astray. One righteous has come to take them. That it was powerful. It, it really touched my heart. Yeah. 
God is holy. He can save people. In other religions, if they created sin, you cannot save people because if there is not any essence of sin in you, how do you create sin? You have created sin, you're unrighteous. It was so powerful. If you're amazed doctrinally, if you're amazed philosophically, of course you'll be amazed socially, politically, morally too. I was really amazed. That Jesus, he changes in ev you in every dimension of your life. Socially I discovered that I can love my wife. Love your wife? Oh my goodness, you better read the Quran about ladies. To see really what kind of heartbreaking verses are there. Great scholars like Razi, Sabzbari, unfortunately many of them are Iranian, Bukhari. Ladies are mute animal. You do not love animal. Possibly you Westerners do not understand you because you love your animals too. <laughs> Gospel says, love your wife as you love your body. The second wife is adultery. You just share the love with one. Oneness is so important in the love of Jesus Christ. And about his morality, I haven't got time to talk to you here. I'm saying to you, really the values of Jesus are so powerful, especially Younger people, you need to really learn this and amaze people. Morally, Islam thinks that Muslims are the best moral example for the world. Sir, if you're not saved, if you're not in the kingdom of God, how can you be a good example to other people? I am in the kingdom of God. I can be a good example to people. I am living with God. I am sharing the holiness of God. I am in the presence of God. I can teach you freedom. I I can teach you peace. I can teach you joy. You cannot, sir. Because I am in it. I am living with God. That's why I'm saying that it's amazing. We can amaze people if you learn that. I said, I'm going to give my life to Jesus. He's so good. And after that, he did other amazing things in my life. You see, I'm a smiling there. <laughs> now, this is, this is the pastor. I said to him, sir, you did a mistake. A wonderful brother. Brought my family. They joined me in Turkey. God, in an amazing way, changed the life of my wife. I was standing in the airport waiting for my family, praising Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My family is going to join me. I'm going to talk to my wife today on the way home. She didn't know I was Christian. If you say, they do not come. <laughs> I forgot she is not coming with cover. I forgot she is Muslim. I was just talking to Jesus, thank you, I'm going to talk to her. As soon as I saw her with four, three others, sad people walking, I said, no, I'm not going to talk to her today. Possibly later. I was afraid to talk to her. Unfortunately, all my you know, experiences in prison came to my mind. That frightened me. As a Christian, you're not, you should not be afraid. You should not be afraid. One of the brothers was, uh, was speaking. Many people in the West are afraid. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Fear is a terrible thing. Anyway, I was a baby in Christ. I left it for later. In the second week, she said to me, why are you treating me like this? I was nice to her. <laughs> are you changed? That was a wonderful sentence. Are you changed? I was so excited. I jumped and brought my Bible. I said, I have given my life to Jesus. <laughs> you remember I was talking to you. I said to her, she was in Iran. I was in 
Istanbul, we were talking through telephone once. She asked me, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I found a friend. I couldn't say this friend is Jesus. She actually made fun of me. She said, you're very clever in finding friends. You found one who took your money and escaped. I don't know what is this one going to do with you. <laughs> I said, this friend is Jesus. I gave my heart to him. He has changed me. She heard that she was terrified. Unfortunately, that's terrifying. For a Muslim to become Christian, it's terrifying. Especially you're a lady. A whole lot of things can happen to you. But God was so good. And he heard our prayers. I was praying. Other brothers and sisters were praying. We encouraged her to go to the church meetings, to ladies' meetings. She didn't go. She made a lot of excuses. I was encouraging ladies really to invite her. But they were not successful. I put pressure on the church ladies. You have to have my wife in your midst. They said, well, she's not coming. You better talk to your wife. I said, I can't talk to her. She's not letting me to talk. After that, she became dictator. You know, I was coming down, she was going up. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's the culture. Someone should be a dictator. Unfortunately. But as I mentioned to you, I, I encouraged the church ladies that tried it again, and she went to their meetings. She actually went for a different purpose. She said, this lady has made me sick. Call me. Come, come, come. I'm going to go there and find a good excuse, and after that, I will use that excuse and will not go there anymore. But Jesus is so clever. He knows what he's doing. She went there. She was amazed. Uh, they were sharing each other, you know, um, blessing. Uh, one of them said, the Lord spoke to me this morning. The other one said, the Lord spoke to me last night. She said, who is this Lord who is speaking to the ladies? <laughs> ladies? She was amazed. She said, my goodness. I am called a mute animal there. A second class citizen. But God is speaking to ladies here. And she continued to go to their meetings. After two and a half months early in the morning, I woke up and she woke up. She said she had a dream with Jesus. What was the dream? Well, we were several ladies walking with Jesus in a mountainous area. They all could go through a steep valley, but as if I was afraid to go. Jesus called me, come. I said, if I come, I fall down. I'm afraid. Jesus said, be not afraid. Take your first step. She took the first step. The valley was lifted up. The mountain was brought down. All mountainside became level, and she walked to Jesus. As soon as I heard, I was amazed. I jumped and brought my Bible. I said, this is written in the Bible. This is the message of Isaiah. You read Isaiah, always it speaks about that. The voice of a calling man in the desert. All valleys and mountains will become level. Why? Because mighty God is walking in front of you. If he walks in front of you, all valleys and mountains of your life will be flattened. I was reading the passages to her. She was crying. That was the morning she opened her heart to the Lord. A beautiful morning. She was crying. I was crying. That was the morning I poured out my heart to her. And I apologized to her. For all the terrible things in the name of Islam I had done to her and called her. That was the morning for the first time in my life I called her honey. Because our Lord is honey. I'm so, so humble in his presence. So, so humble. I think I can speak to every person in the world. But really, when I come to his presence, I just feel so humble. Because he's so sweet. He's sweeter than honey. He's yummy. He's delicious. <laughs> his words are powerful. We need really to live as his words. And he changed us, our life, and brought us and made us one with each other.
They are the princesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are beautiful, aren't they? I don't want them to close their faces. I just want to see their faces. Look at them. And I'm sure my Heavenly Father more than me loves to see them, their beauty. They are the princesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. Islam says to them, you're second class. Islam Muslim scholars says to them, you're animal. But Jesus says, you're my princess. Your ladies, your girls are the princesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you? Praise the Lord. People are nodding their heads. You men are the princes of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I'm saying to you, you should not be afraid. You're, when you know who your father is, he is mightier than everyone else in the world. You should not be afraid. You should be a warrior, a courageous lady, a courageous man, powerful man. You have to speak with the love of Jesus Christ. He never said, go kill people. Quran is the same size as the gospel is. It's full of killing verses, but you do not find one in the gospel. Go and kill. Why should you should be afraid? Somebody is saying to you, love Muslims, love Jews, love Hindus, love Buddhists, love everyone, love the world. Why you should be afraid? You're talking about the love of Jesus Christ. You have to be warrior for the Lord Jesus Christ. You have to speak out. Australia needs you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of losing your job. Be excommunicated. That's not the, the value of Christ. That's not the will of Christ. That's not the desire of Jesus Christ. He has saved you to be the light and salt of Australia. He is so good. He says, you, you're the salt and, and light of the world, he says. He is so good. He always says, my follower is great because I am great. You should not be afraid. One Muslim said to me, sir, your life is going to finish very soon. I said, I don't think so. How do you know that? Are you God? I said, sir, I believe in a God who is sovereign God. If he doesn't want me to be killed, that's not you to kill me. But if he wants me, nobody is able to hold me here. Brothers and sisters, friends, if you're not even the follower of Jesus Christ, feel for your country. You saw the values, you heard the values of Islam. And you, if you do not know about the values of Jesus Christ, please, please as soon as possible. They start to read the gospel. He is so good. He is so beautiful. We need to live for him and put him in the first priority. He is better than everything. I have to love him more than my spouse, more than my children, because if I do not love him more than my family, more than my friends, then I will not be able to love my family you know, you know, appropriately. He is so good. Let us live for him. May the Lord Jesus Christ empower all of you. Touch all of your hearts so that you can renew your vow with the Lord Jesus Christ and stand for him boldly. Thank you so much for your time.